One of the first equations that uh, one encounters in the quantum theory of fields or quantum field theory is the so-called the Klein-Gordon equation, also abbreviated as KG. K stands for Klein and G stands for Gordon. And it can be written in the following fashion. So we have minus D'Alembert operator plus M squared, the mass of the particle squared. And then here we have a scalar field, phi of x, equal to zero. Here I'm using a, a certain uh, convention where uh, the um, matrix representation of uh, the Lorentz metric, era mu nu, is given by the diagonal matrix, where on the diagonal we have minus 1, 1, 1, 1. So this is the convention and also the fact that we set h bar equal to c equal to 1, where c is the speed of light and h bar is the reduced uh, Planck constant. And also the anti-commutation relation between uh, the gamma matrices, which are important in um, half integer spin, and we'll see that we have uh, the, the anti commutator gamma mu gamma nu equal to minus 2 era mu nu. The D'Alembert operator can be written as d mu d mu. So this equation here is the Klein Gordon equation, and since it does not contain any internal degrees of freedom, it is associated to a particle with spin equal to zero. I mean, the field phi is associated uh, with a particle with spin equal to zero. Then, the second equation, the second, the second most important equation that you probably come across in uh, quantum field theory is the Dirac equation. So, the Dirac equation can be written in the following fashion. Gamma mu d mu divided by the imaginary unit i plus the mass of the particle, and then we have a field psi, but we also need to put a subscript here, A, to denote the fact that this is a spinner. The spinner contains uh, four components, so this is a four spinner with four components, four components. So A can take four values, basically, and the equation tells, that, tells us that this is equal to zero. It's associated to a spin one half because uh, out of these four components, we can think that two of them describe uh, the electron or the particle, and two of them, the other two of them, the remaining two, describe the antiparticle. So we can associate uh, two values of, of spin to each particle. So we can have minus one half and one half, and also here minus one half and one half. So you see four numbers, but actually we have two values of spin, two possible values for each particle. So we have four numbers. And this is the Dirac equation. So you see that the spinner has four components. This, this number four comes from A here. Now, the subsequent step, which is more unusual because uh, you don't come across the subsequent equation so often. But let me tell you the name of the equation. It, it, it's called the Proca. Proca equation, and this is an equation associated to a massive particle with spin 1. So, for example, the photon has spin 1, but it is massless. So, it's a special case, let's say, of this equation. And uh, let me also mention and highlight the fact that uh, there are no elementary particles with spin higher than 1, except for the graviton, but there are particles with spin 0, spin 1 half, spin 1. And particles with higher spin are usually composed of uh, lower spin particles. Anyway, let me write the equation. For spin 1, this is an integer, integer spin. So the form of the equation will be very similar to the Klein-Gordon equation up there. So we have a, a wave equation, basically, minus the D'Alembert operator plus m squared, just like in the case of... Uh, the Klein-Gordon equation, but in this case we apply this uh, operator, the, this um, overall operator, to v mu of x, so we have um, a 4 vector, and we set it equal to 0, and uh, the, the 4 vector has 4 components, 4 components. We add another constraint to our field, so the field uh, should uh, satisfy the following constraint, d mu v mu equal to zero, like this. 
So an intuitive way of uh, thinking about the spin here is that due to this constraint, out of the four components, the four independent components, we actually have one constraint that tells us that we have three independent components. And if you think about spin one, we can have the three possible values, minus one, zero, and one. And these are the possible values for a particle with uh, a certain mass. So it is not massless because for the photon, it's actually different because you have two possible polarizations. The subsequent um, important equation in physics is the so-called Rarita Schwinger equation. This equation is associated to a particle with spin uh, three halves. The form of the equation will be similar to the one associated with spin one half, which is the Dirac equation. So we have this operator here, which is some kind of square root of uh, this operator here. It's not really uh, rigorous uh, mathematics or a, a rigorous uh, way of saying that, but it is quite um, useful to think that in that way. And anyway, the Ritter Schwinger will have the following form. We have a gamma mu d mu divided by the imaginary unit plus the mass of the particle. Here we have psi sub a, so this is a, a spinner index, but we also have nu, which is a Lorentz index. This is called the Lorentz index of x equal to zero. So we have two indices which, which can take uh, four values each. So all in all, we have uh, 16 components here. And we have uh, some constraints, in particular, gamma nu psi nu a of x is equal to zero. And this is known as the Ritter Schwinger equation, in particular, these two together. This set of equations together gives you the Ritter Schwinger equation. They can be put together, but I don't want to put them together. It is possible to write just one equation which contains these two but it's simpler to treat it in this way. And uh, if we multiply the first equation by gamma nu with the lower nu, you can write the first equation like this, gamma nu, gamma mu, d mu plus m gamma nu acting on psi nu a. Now, when this gamma nu acts on psi nu a, this will give zero due to this uh, constraint. And all in all, we, have to, we, we must get zero there. And then when I multiply these two together, I can use uh, one of the equations that I wrote uh, at the beginning of this video. In particular, I can use uh, this property of uh, the gamma matrices. And uh, if I use that property, I can rewrite this as uh, minus gamma mu, gamma nu, minus two delta mu nu where uh, delta mu nu, if you want, is equal to the Lorentz metric with the superscript mu and the subscript, subscript mu. But uh, if you use this, uh, this uh, property, you can easily see that at this point you get d mu psi mu a equal to zero. Because when you act with this on uh, this object here, thanks to this property, you will get zero. So you are left with this uh, Kronecker delta, the partial derivative, and this object here that will give you this uh, constraint. So you have this constraint and this constraint here. So you have uh, 16 components, but you have four of such equations. They are four because you can vary this index A, and you have another four from here. So you have 16 minus 4 minus 4, which is equal to 8. So in this case, as well, you have the particle and the antiparticle. So you can split this 8 into 4 and 4. And uh, it means that spin, in this case, for each of the particle and uh, the, the antiparticle, can be uh, described by means of four components. So in particular, these four components are minus 3 halves, minus 1 half, one half and three halves. So this is why this is an equation that describes a spin three halves particle. Now to conclude, I also want to describe a spin two particle, which is the subsequent step. And the equation for spin two 
we have an integer spin, so we have to consider such an operator acting on a certain tensor, and in this case we will have to add another index, another Lorentz index, so we need to have two of those, so we have a minus d'Alembert plus m squared, then we have a certain tensor u with two indices mu and nu of x equal to zero. And we add the following constraints, d mu u mu nu equal to zero. We also add the constraint that u mu nu is symmetric. And finally, we take the trace of u mu mu and we set it equal to zero. So this is the trace because we have to sum over mu here. So this is one equation. These are four equations. And uh, in principle, we have 16 components, u mu nu, but due to the symmetry of u mu nu, we only get 10. So we get 10 minus 4 minus 1, the constraints, that gives us a description of uh, spin 2. So we have five, only five um, components to describe spin 2, which are minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. So you can see from here that actually you don't have the antiparticles. You don't have the particle and the antiparticle. You just have the particle. Just like, for, for example, in the case of uh, spin 1, because you don't have the photon and the antiphoton, for example. And here, an important particle for spin 2 is uh, the graviton. Finally, let me tell you that this equation here also has a name. And when I say equation, I'm, I'm saying all these conditions together, actually. So it's not really just an equation. But um, this is uh, related to Pauli and Fiertz. And it's called the Pauli-Fiertz equation if you take all those together and you combine them.